This is part one of the hygiene lecture. Let's begin by talking about personal hygiene. As a nurse, you will be assisting patients with their hygiene care. That's any kind of self-care, grooming activities, bathing, showers, anything of that sort. And that's really one of the most fundamental skills and types of care that we provide as nurses. It is so important because it helps with the patient's physical well-being and their psychological well-being. Whenever you are caring for a patient, you always want to make sure that we are getting them you know, as clean as possible and keeping them as comfortable as possible while providing hygiene care. We also need to make sure that we're providing that care in a very safe manner. While providing care, we need to try to keep as much privacy for the patient as possible. We'll talk about different ways of how to do that by covering the patient and things like that. But we need to know that providing privacy is helping to maintain that patient's dignity and that is a priority in our nursing care. As a nursing student, you will be giving baths and assisting with showers for patients. And it's very important after we provide hygiene care that then we maintain a very clean and safe environment for the patient. So what I mean by that is we would never leave any dirty towels, any dirty linens, things like that on the floor because then that's a, a tripping hazard for the patient and that's putting them at risk for falls. So we always make sure that we declutter and that we tidy up the patient's room after we are finished with hygiene care and uh, I'll just say OTC nursing students have a very good reputation with that so we want to make sure that we maintain that. With hygiene practices there's definitely an influence on uh, how we provide those with different age groups. So let's first start with newborns and infants, our young pediatric patients. Of course, they are totally dependent on us in providing care. And also you can think about parents in, in that role, providing care for their newborns or infants. So we would wanna teach those families to never leave the child unattended in, uh, in the water, in the bathtub. Uh, newborns, infants, you know, young children, they chill pretty easily. And so we want to make sure that we keep a nice warm room for them and a nice warm temperature for the water. Not too hot though, we wouldn't want to have any uh, scalding concerns, but definitely warm water. And it's also important to know that newborns and infants don't necessarily need a daily bath. Their skin dries out pretty easily, so they can go a couple of days, maybe every other day, you know, what the whatever the parents or the care providers kind of prefer on that um, in between bathing. So also teaching parents that maybe if the child struggles with dry skin, moisturizers also can be a benefit as well after the bath. Then we move on to toddler and preschool age. Of course, they're getting more independent, so we can allow them to do a little bit more with the bathing, but still we don't leave them unattended, still a risk there, safety risk. Attention to cleanliness after activities like play and toileting, and toddler age is a really good age to start teaching about the importance of hand hygiene and hand washing, and preschool age also important to teach that as well as they go and head into kindergarten school age. Children and then moving into adolescent age groups definitely have more privacy concerns and they want their privacy maintained so we need to respect that and provide that as best as we can. <clears throat> also lots of education uh, can be provided to these age groups about maybe starting shaving, uh, acne treatment, body odor and different deodorants soaps, things like that, that can be used to help assist with that. So lots of education and guidance can be provided to those age groups. Then we move into our adult age group, more so talking about our older adults, our geriatric population. There's a lot of safety concerns when it comes to bathing, showers, things like that. It's a high risk for slip and fall, so we need to make sure that we're always providing a very safe environment. <coughs> These, uh, this age group also can chill pretty easily. So we wanna make sure that we keep a nice warm room, a nice warm water temperature, not too hot. It's also important to know that older adults do not necessarily need a daily bath or a daily shower. 
Okay, they may only bathe maybe a couple times a week. Their skin also dries out very easily. So again, that's another reason why you may only see bathing a couple times a week because of the dry skin concerns. Always providing privacy for adult patients just like we do for children and any age group that is very concerned with that and it's also important to assure that those that are not able to provide their own care that we are kind of bridging that gap and, and assisting them with whatever care that they need. So maybe they can wash their arms and their abdomen and their chest but maybe they have a really difficult time with washing their hair, their back, their legs, their feet. So then I can be there to help assist with that. So we're still giving them that independence and that dignity in their care by allowing them to do as much as they can on their own and then I'm there to assist with the rest of that. <clears throat> the health state of the patient is very important as well when it comes to skin care and the increased risk of injury to the skin. Patients who are higher risk, those patients that have very thin, frail skin, and a lot of times our geriatric patients can fall within that category. So we need to be very cautious and very gentle with their skin while cleansing it. Obese patients also have a high risk for skin breakdown because in between skin folds, moisture can build up and that can cause lots of skin breakdown and skin irritation. For those patients who come in with great amounts of fluid loss, maybe they've had a prolonged fever, they've been having vomiting, diarrhea, any of those concerns can lead to dehydration and the skin needs to be well hydrated in order to maintain its integrity. So those patients who are dehydrated have a high risk for skin breakdown. The perspiration or the, just the moisture buildup, again in between skin folds can lead to skin breakdown and that's a concern. Patients who have jaundiced skin often complain of very dry, itchy feeling to the skin, so there's a concern. And then any other chronic skin diseases that a patient may have, like psoriasis or eczema, any of those conditions, and how do they manage those at home, and is their treatment being effective in maintaining their skin integrity? There may be some diseases <clears throat> that inhibit the patient's ability to perform their own hygiene care. Maybe the patient gets very short of breath while they're providing hygiene care, they're doing a bath or they're doing a shower, and that may actually decrease their ability or just their desire to even perform hygiene care because it wears them out so much. If they're having a lot of maybe weakness, dizziness, a fear of falling, if a patient has already experienced a fall, this is a very very real concern that then patients will decrease their activity level because they have a very real fear of falling again. So that might decrease their desire to take a bath or shower. If they have any heart conditions and breathing problems, like I said, that patient that may get real short of breath, we might need to modify the environment while we're doing a bed bath. Things like raising the head of the bed. The patient doesn't have to be completely flat the whole time and if by doing that that helps ease their breathing it's gonna you know allow them to be able to withstand that bath a lot better and be able to tolerate that a lot better and same with heart conditions they can get real short of breath just real exhausted and maybe we need to kind of slow down our hygiene care not rush the patient and that might help them to tolerate that a little bit better and if the patient has any medical devices, like a cast on an extremity, lots of different uh, tubes, drains, IVs, different things like that that we have to work around, we need to uh, assess that prior to performing hygiene care and identify how exactly we're going to work around those devices. <clears throat> we always need to consider the patient's cultural background. Lots of different cultures have different views about hygiene practices. Some examples, some cultures find body odor offensive and some do not. Some cultures find privacy important and some do not. So it is very important that we identify the differences in the different cultures and what the patient prefers. We need to make sure that, that as a nurse, 
we always remain very non-judgmental and we always try to promote and you know do whatever we can to meet their normal cultural background and, and what they prefer so whatever their preferences are then we need to respect that and honor that when you uh, are caring for children, okay, they're going to be learning those hygiene practices from their family and from their culture. So whatever they're used to at home, what their normal is, then that's what we need to try to provide for them when we're providing care. Okay, so if that's a used to a morning bath or an evening bath, how often do they shampoo? What's the family's feelings about you know body odor, nudity? I mean, all of those normal cultural differences. We need to identify those and assess that and honor their wishes. With religious and spiritual practices, again, some religions and uh, you know cultures might have different rules related to personal hygiene. Some examples, some religions strictly forbid males to attend to females hygiene needs and hygiene practices. So there's nothing, um, you know, male nurse should never be personally offended by that. You need to understand that that is what they have grown up to know in their religion and in their beliefs, so we need to honor that and respect that. So someone else would need to come do that hygiene care. Maybe they feel that a garment needs to be worn at all times during hygiene care to help provide that privacy. So we would need to honor and respect that and provide that for the patient. What are the personal preferences of the patient? Do they prefer a shower versus a tub bath or a bed bath? Do they have certain products and soaps, lotions, things of that nature that they prefer to use, different brands that they like? Maybe there's a certain brand that they prefer, maybe a family member could bring that from home and we could use that for them. Most people will prefer a warm room and a warm water temperature. Just assess that and make sure that that is what they would prefer. Do they prefer to have bathing done in the morning or sometimes in the evening before bedtime and it helps to relax the patient? So what is their preference there? And then are there any socioeconomic factors that have affected hygiene practices at home? Maybe the patient has not had the financial means in order to buy soaps, lotions, any of those hygiene deodorants, any of those hygiene care products at home, so they haven't been using them. And that is something that can be pretty apparent on uh, assessing a patient on admission if they haven't had good hygiene practices. Well, maybe there's some kind of a financial reason for that. So assess that as well. <clears throat> when providing hygiene care, we really need to make sure that we are respecting the patient's personal space. Everyone has that need of a, a personal space physically and just you know, overall in their whole environment. So not even just hygiene care, but also maybe patients taking a personal phone conversation and I need to clue into that and respect that and leave the room and allow them to have that private time. So that's just something in general we as nurses really need to consider. And we also, if we provide that privacy uh, during hygiene care, it gives the patient some sense of control and not, you know, that not all of their care is being taken out of their hands, that we are allowing them that dignity and that respect. So that's very important as well. Simple things like before you go into a patient's room, always knock on a door. Let them know you're coming in. Ask them if it's an okay time to come in. You never know, like I said, if they're taking a private phone call that they really would prefer no one be in there for. Maybe the patient's on the bedside commode and they need some privacy. We just always need to make sure that we assess that before we walk into the room. And then while bathing the patient, we always drape them, keep them covered with a bath blanket to help provide that privacy. And it also does provide warmth for the patient as well. <coughs> When we look at special skin care needs, specifically for the elderly population, some very important things to consider. In the diet, nutritionally, we know that protein and that vitamin C play a big role in the health of just the overall body, in wound care, if they have a wound that's healing, those are very important in the healing process, also just with the overall immune system and boosting immunity. 
So we need to try to provide some education for the patient about those things and how can we incorporate those more into their diet. Is the patient, patient at a healthy weight? Are they underweight? Are they very thin and they have very frail skin? Maybe they're an obese patient and they have the skin concerns with moisture buildup in skin folds. So those are things to consider. Maybe it would be beneficial to the patient to have a daily multivitamin. So we, that could be something that is discussed with the primary care physician and maybe that could nutritionally boost the patient's skin needs there. Fluids. The skin needs to be well hydrated in order to maintain good skin integrity. So hydration is very, very important. And then with bathing elderly patients, as I mentioned earlier, it's not necessary that they have a full bath every single day. Maybe only a couple times a week because their skin does dry out very easily and they just don't have as much perspiration on the skin as younger populations, younger adults and kids. So it's really not necessary. So a full bath, maybe just two or three times a week. S some ways to help combat that dry, dehydrated skin, maybe lotion soaps, maybe moisturizers after bathing, applying lotion to the skin is very helpful and beneficial. In the home environment, maybe we could do some teaching for the patient about increasing humidity through like humidifiers uh, during those winter months and then teaching them about the risk to the skin with direct sun exposure. <coughs> With nursing, you guys will figure out as you go through the program that with what we call the nursing process, we always start with assessment. Okay, Assessment is the first step when we care for our patients. So we always need to assess what are their skin and their hygiene practices and their skin care needs and what are their self-care abilities. You know, so what soaps, what deodorants do they prefer? Do they have special facial soaps that they prefer to use? Any special makeup remover products? Assessing those things from the start. And how much of the care can the patient do on their own? Can they reach their feet? Maybe that is too exerting for the patient. And so that's where I can step in and assist with their foot care. Can they safely navigate and ambulate in and out of the tub? <clears throat> or is this you know, going to be a major fall risk for the patient? So how can we modify that environment to make it safer? Can they comb their own hair? Can they dry their own hair? Again, do they get very short of breath? Do they have like a broken arm or some kind of an extremity? that's in a cast and how are we going to work around that. So we need to identify what the self-care abilities are and where do I need to assist the patient. Do they have any past or current skin problems? Things like psoriasis, acne, skin cancer. Have they had any past burns, severe burns to the skin that had grafting done? Um, do they have a current burn to the skin? that we are providing care for. Also need to identify, does the patient have any allergies to any maybe soaps, fragrances, anything like that that causes them to break out in a rash? So I need to identify that and avoid those items. Do they have that really thin, frail skin? And I need to make sure that I'm very gentle when providing care for that kind of skin. Are there on any medications that might put their skin at risk or cause any skin problems? Are they receiving any creams, lotions? Are there any patches on the skin? Any of those kinds of medications I would need to identify and be aware of. <clears throat> we always need to make sure that we're doing a good physical assessment on the patient, patient and do that with good lighting in the room so you can get a good visual of how the skin is and what the condition is of the skin. Do they have any abrasions? Do they have a nice warm skin temperature or they have uh, cold skin areas? The skin turgor tells me about the hydration status of the skin, so I would need to assess that. Is the color normal for their race and ethnicity? Respirations, do they get short of breath or do they have a normal respiratory rate and a normal pattern? The heart rate, do they get real tachycardic or a high heart rate with activity? 
How are their pulses in the extremities? Do they have good blood flow to the extremities? Is there good color? That tells me there's good blood flow. Are there any issues with the musculoskeletal system as far as mobility? Can they move all their joints? Do they have good muscle strength and ability to perform their own hygiene care? With the GI system, is there any abdominal dis distension or discomfort going on? What are their normal bowel patterns and bowel habits? Genitourinary wise, are they having any issues with burning or painful urination? Just overall general health, we would need to assess that. Here's a picture of the skin turgor that I mentioned. So again, this tells us about the hydration status of the skin. So whenever you pinch the skin, there you can see here in the picture they're doing on the top of the hand, when you do that, if the skin returns to the original state quickly after being pulled up and is released, then that tells me that's normal skin turgor and that the skin is well hydrated. But if you pinch the skin up and it stays elevated, kind of tinted in a way, that tells me that they have decreased skin turgor, which means that is a sign of dehydration. Okay, so they are lacking that fluid that they need. So that puts the skin at risk for injury. Some general, just normal skin characteristics, things that we would hope to see in the skin, that it's smooth, soft, and intact. There's no open areas, no abrasions. Should be nice and dry to the touch, nice and warm to the touch. Skin turgor is intact, normal. There's no tenting, no signs of dehydration. Just always know that the skin color can vary with different areas of the body and that is normal. Hair should be nice and evenly distributed throughout the body. Capillary refill tells us about circulation in the body, so in the extremities. If you pinch on the nail beds, if you take your finger and you pinch on the nail bed, you see it kind of blanches white, and then you release, you should see it refill, blood flow, pink up. Okay, that nail bed should pink right back up. We want to see that within a less than three seconds time frame. And what that tells me is that they have good circulation. So that's a good capillary refill is less than three seconds. And we got to have good blood flow and good circulation in order to keep nice, healthy, intact skin. Nails should be nice and smooth, strong, kept short, cut straight across. Mucous membranes should be nice and moist and intact. No open areas, no abrasions. How can patients help prevent dry skin and help maintain hydration? Ideally, six to eight glasses of water a day is what they say we need in order just to keep a nice, hydrated, you know, overall body and, and skin. Harsh soaps can also cause drying to the skin, particularly if the soap is left on the skin to dry. So this is an important part when we get to the bed bath procedure. You guys will see how we talk about when we clean the skin with soap, we apply the soap to the washcloth and then we cleanse the skin and then we rinse out the soap with the water that's in the bath basin and then we clean all that soap off the skin then. So we never put soap in the water that's in the bath basin because then that soap then is going to be left on the skin to dry and that is very hard on the skin and that's going to cause some very dry irritated skin. So that's very important whenever we provide a bed bath. Avoiding alcohol uh, may need a humidifier just to help again promote that humidity during those dry winter months. Always pat the skin dry. We don't want to leave any moisture on the skin, any water after a bed bath because that could cause some skin breakdown. Lots of high risk areas like in between the toes, in, in between skin folds, in between the fingers, things like that. So always make sure that we're getting those areas nice and dry. Hot water can be very drying to the skin as well. So again, a nice warm water temperature is best. And then lotions applied immediately after bathing is very beneficial, especially if the patient is struggling with dry skin. You're going to find, as a nurse, while you're providing hygiene care, 
you are establishing and developing a therapeutic relationship with that patient. It's a great time to provide patient education, just to overall communicate with your patient, ask them how they're feeling, just overall, you know, how are they doing with the situation, with their health, do they have any concerns. It's just a good time to discuss all those things and you're really building trust with the patient and establishing that rapport with the patient. Comfort is also something else that is provided through hygiene care. It is very, uh, you'll find that it is a very good way to help decrease a patient's pain. When you provide a patient with like a bed bath and you apply lotion after the bath, think about those patients that have been lying in bed for days to weeks, that they've been on bed rest for that long. They are just so uncomfortable in that bed. So a, you know, a little bit of a shoulder massage, a back rub, anything like that goes a long way for those patients to help just decrease their pain, increase their comfort. It helps relax them and it just makes them feel much better overall physically and psychologically. Also provides them just that sense of someone is there caring for them, that they're not alone. So that's where that psychological component comes in and provide any sense of normalcy with the hygiene care. So again, if a patient prefers to bathe in the morning, it makes them feel like they're you know, ready for the day. We need to try to provide that as best as we can. Or maybe it's that patient who prefers the evening bathing before they go to bed and it helps relax them. So how can we provide that for the patient? Some general guidelines to end with here for the first part of the hygiene lecture. It's important to know that the skin is the body's first line of defense. So it's so important that we keep nice, intact, healthy skin. And we do that by providing hygiene care. The degree of protection depends on the general health of the patient's cells, the amount of subcutaneous tissue that they have, and the hydration status of the skin. As I've mentioned a couple of times, any moisture in contact with the skin for long periods of time can and will result in irritation to the skin. It can cause bacterial growth. And again, that increases the risk for then skin breakdown. It's important to remember when we provide hygiene care, we always wanna provide privacy and warmth we maintain a safe environment, preventing any falls from occurring. Promote independence for the patient as best as we can. We're not there to do everything for them. If they are you know, able to and physically can do some of their care, then absolutely we will allow that. And then I am there just to help with whatever cannot be done. But there are those patients that might need total patient care and I'm there to do that as well. So we just have to assess that situation and identify what level of care am I going to need to provide. What are the patient's activity limitations? And that will probably relate to what's their physical condition. Give them as much control as possible. We of course are going to allow them to pick whatever soaps, lotions, you know, are they, getting, are they preferring a shower to a bath if they're physically able to get up into the shower? So allow them to choose those, choose those things. And then general guideline as far as how to bathe, we always use this rule of thumb. We bathe from clean to dirty areas. And always remember, not all people need a daily bath. We've talked about some of those special age groups, maybe our young population, newborns and infants, or our older population, geriatric patients, maybe a couple times a week. Again, the skin can dry out really easily with that daily bathing. So some of those patients do not need that. And also know that not everyone has to bathe in the morning. The evening bathing might be the preference as well for the patient. So we just honor and respect as much of that as we can. This is where we'll end part one and we will continue on with part two next.